Sure. Well, <clears throat> thanks for inviting me back. I'm always happy to visit with the, the Goody County Historical Society membership and always happy, uh, probably absurdly so, to talk about archaeology in the upper Midwest and particularly the Red Wing area, which as some of you will probably know uh, or, or remember from my previous talks, is really just a, a particularly interesting area um, and uh, an area that you know, I continue to research. I've been working at it for 20 some years and we're gonna continue working on it and figuring out more of the, uh, the puzzles as we go along. So I wanted to start uh, with noting uh, just kind of uh, um, one observation and two questions. And pardon me while my clock rings in the background, sorry about that. Um, so um, as this kind of basic observation that forms a starting point, for thinking about what is, you know, what was going on about a thousand years ago. Um, we have to start with understanding that there's a um, kind of a, a general change or a whole series of changes that happened across the entire Midwest and actually across the continent of, of North America um, between around 900 and uh, 1400 AD or CE as the current uh, prevention or current preference in naming goes. Um, and the, there's a whole lot of changes going on that's across a whole lot of different groups. And this is no different in the Red Wing area, although in the Red Wing area, it's especially pronounced. And so the question that comes out of that one observation is, one, how do we best characterize these changes? Um, that requires us to think about a couple of different things, right? One is what did the changes consist of? And two is who was involved? So if we want to think about what did the changes consist of, we have to, we were required to do three different things. One, look at archaeological sites and materials uh, from before, during, and after that, the, the focus of our research. And then to figure out who was involved, we need to then put all of that local archaeological research into a broader regional context. That is, think about what's going on more broadly in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Illinois and Iowa, right? Because otherwise we just, you know, we're, we're looking too closely at things and we don't, probably are going to miss broader patterns that might have some value in helping us interpret what's going on. So that's one, right? How do we best characterize the changes that are going on? looking at what they consist of and who was involved. Now, question two that comes out of that is the kind of more, well, not more interesting, but the, the, the one that um, has remained until recently to, to start being addressed. Um, and that's not to say nobody ever tried to talk about it before, but it is to say that um, people have speculated uh, a couple of different ways about it, but there hasn't really been a lot of really good information coming out about it. And now we're starting to actually address this. So this question, the second question is, why did this happen? Right. So given what we can actually see in terms of the, the, the kind of changes, where they're going on, what they consist of and all of that, we then have to ask that question, what accounts for that going on? Why did those changes happen? So let's first talk about how do we characterize these changes that were going on? Now, some of the things uh, some of you may remember from previous talks, and I won't belabor an awful lot of these points because there's other stuff to talk about as well. Um, but to give you some background on the Red Wing region uh, in terms of its archaeology, uh, the region consists of better than 150 known sites. And now note, there's undoubtedly lots more that we simply haven't found yet. Right. Uh, there's been just a history of a few people doing research over the years and not a heck of a lot of truly comprehensive research. So any time we're out in the whole region, we find more and more sites. Um, so, so it's better, certainly better than 150 sites on both sides of the Mississippi River. And those sites consist of a couple different main things, right? One is literally thousands of burial mounds that were built on bluff edges and terrace edges uh, around the Red Wing area, around the head of Lake Pepin. And I'll show you maps throughout all of this, so don't worry if you can't carry all that around in your head. Um, and it's also important to remember that Red Wing as a particular location is in a really, really interesting spot. 
because it is at the junction of a whole bunch of rivers, um, you know, all the Mississippi and the St. Croix and the Cannon and the Wind and the Trimbal and the Big and, and, and all of these different rivers and, and creeks, right? Isabel and Hay and, and Wells and all of these different creeks, right into the head of Lake Pepin right there. Right. So it's really at a very, very interesting place um, uh, geographically. Uh, not only that, but it's also at the kind of the junction from where we pick up the northern woodlands, the eastern woodlands, and then the west or the eastern prairies. Right. So there's the woodlands and the prairies and different kinds of woodlands. It's really at a meeting place of not only a lot of different rivers, but a lot of different kind of eco regions. So that makes it terribly, terribly interesting from a, an archaeological standpoint, because it means that there's people there or nearby who are adapting to and utilizing various different environments right there. So it's right in the center of all that action going on, and that will return later in my talk. So before about 1995, there's a kind of an uneven pace of work. Right? Um, I think Lloyd Wilford started working in the area in 1947. He came back in like 1950 and then did a bunch of work in the 1950s, particularly at the Bryan site. Eldon Johnson did a couple little excavations in the 1960s, but didn't spend a heck of a lot of time doing much. Um, Clark Dobbs did a big excavation at Bryan um, in the, the 1980s and did extra excavations in a few different places. I started working in, in Red Wing in uh, 98, 1998, 1999, right around in there. And I've never stopped. I come back, you know, virtually every season and continue doing more work. So there's, in all of that work that took place before I started doing stuff every year, the work was a little bit uneven. And there are some basic problems with some of the things or the ways that things were done. One, there was very, very little emphasis on what we call the late woodland. That is, before this big series of changes happened, or at least we think before these big series of changes happened, there's a whole bunch of people there doing all kinds of different things, and that's the late woodland period, but nobody bothered really researching it. Nobody bothered really looking for the sites or figuring them out. And, and in fact, in some cases, like with Eldon Johnson's work, when he found uh, late woodland components, that is, late woodland pit features, stuff like that, at the Bartron village on Prairie Island, he actively disregarded them. Uh, he said, well, I'm here to look at Oneota stuff. And he put this in his notes, by the way. So he, he said, I'm here to look at Oneota stuff, not late woodland stuff. So we're going to ignore these late woodland features, which now I'm just like, oh my God, why did you do that? But anyway, so there was little to no emphasis on the late woodland. Two, um, most of the work before the mid 90s really focused on figuring out the, the Mississippian related aspects of what's called the silver nail phase. Now we'll talk more about all of that stuff as it goes on. So, so don't worry that if you don't really understand that right now. And that's really kind of the answer, the, the original answer to the first question, right? And it's, it's not the correct answer, but it's what the original answer people thought of was that when we look at the pottery, there's like some Mississippian flair to it, middle Mississippian, like from around the great city of Cahokia um, that was active around the same time. And so people thought initially that because there was some Middle Mississippian related stuff, that this must be a Middle Mississippian city, right? And so that's kind of that initial answer is like, why, why, what's the excuse for all the change happening in Red Wing? Well, it's the Mississippians. Um, well, well, we'll get to dispelling that myth, um, which I'm, I'm busy doing all over the place as much as I can. Um, but the evidence for that, when we look at it, is actually pretty darn thin. Um, and we'll go through that, but, but it, almost as soon as that idea was proposed, it became really clear that it was not a completely satisfactory answer, but nobody really had a better answer until we've been working on this in the last uh, 10, 20 years. And another um, uh, problem with the work that was done before the mid 90s um, is that basically people just kind of assumed that the Red Wing area was abandoned after about 1300 AD, that everybody moved elsewhere. Um, and and the, I still see in print on occasion, uh, people think that Red Wing was abandoned and everybody moved down to La Crosse, um, despite the fact that there's no actual evidence of that. Uh, there's no artifactual similarities between Red Wing and La Crosse. 
And so I don't know how moving, what, 100 miles downriver, 80 miles downriver, I don't know how that would just completely cause people to utterly change everything that they do. Uh, but now well, that was the idea that people had. So that's that a little bit of background. So here's a little overview map for you to see what the, what the Red Wing region, as I refer to it, is. Um, now, please note that yellow outline is not a protoceratops. Um, which is a kind of a dinosaur. Uh, it just happened to turn out that way, which I think is kind of fun because I happen to like protoceratopses. I think they're pretty cool. They're a, an, an ancestor to the triceratops, you know, with the ones with big horns and the big shield. And so anyway, that's not what it actually is, right? Um, now, it's possible that there, we may need to extend some of these areas or maybe truncate some of these areas, but this is kind of the core of uh, the area that I'm talking about when I say the Red Wing region. Um, so, uh, right, yeah, so in the, if, I think if you can see my cursor right here is Barn Bluff. So Red Wing is all of this stuff in here, right? And I don't like putting the modern boundaries on and everything because, you know, that's, that's not relevant to what I'm particularly doing, so I don't tend to put them on. Okay, so that's where we're talking about. Now, when we zoom in a little bit or look at the distribution of sites in the area, what we can see is that uh, those blue dots are kind of scattered um, all over the place. Those are late woodland sites. Uh, those yellow dots, those are all Oneota sites. They're a little bit later. Um, and then the dots in the middle, like the orange and purple and red, those are sites where we have evidence of multiple different things going on, particularly the silver nail phase. Okay? So that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about. So you have a, a kind of a mental, tam mental map of where these sites are and, and what we're looking at. Okay. So in terms of figuring out the late woodland, right? So me stepping back and saying, okay, there's some problems with some of this early work and we need to figure out what was really kind of going on with um, all of these, these this fluorescence, this, this sudden emergence of all of these big villages. And we need to understand where that's coming out. Of. So uh, there are two named nearby uh, late woodland phases. Now, uh, phase you can actually understand as just kind of a period of time during which people were doing typical or characteristic things, right? And so when we look in, in one area, it may be people making a specific kind of pottery and specific kinds of stone tools and particular kinds of houses and eating plants and animals of you know certain types of things like that and that differing to their neighbors who are making a different kind of pottery and eating different kinds of plants and animals and building different kinds of houses and so forth, right? So that's what we mean when I use the word phase, right? It's just a characteristic way of pe that people did things for a particular reason or for a particular time period in a specific location, okay? Now then, there's a nearby late woodland phase called the Nininger phase. Now, this is something that Eldon Johnson actually proposed back in the mid 1960s and nobody really paid a lot of attention to it because he didn't have very good evidence of it. But as we've done work, and, and I you know, refer to myself, uh, you, know, um, you know, I've been done a lot, of, a lot of work. I work very closely with Dr. Ed Fleming from the Science Museum. He's done a lot of work. And we started to put together a better sense of where we see this kind of pottery in particular that's shown in that upper slide or the, uh, that upper image. This is a kind of pottery called Bremer Triangular Punk Tape. And you can see why it's called Bremer Triangular Punk Tape. Well, you can't see why it's called Bremer, but it was found at the Bremer site named after a family. So <laughs> that's the Bremer part. But the triangular punk tape is pretty obvious. If there's little triangular punk tapes, little puncture marks all over it that are made with some kind of a triangular tool. Um, and now, interestingly, this is like the only kind of pottery that is, it, and it's just got triangular punk tapes. That's all it has on it. And you can see in a couple of those upper shirts that uh, the upper surface is kind of toothed. It's notched, right? So that's the kind of pottery that shows up kind of in the Red Wing area and to points north, going a little ways up into the St. Croix River um, uh, and, and a little ways a little ways up towards St. Paul in the, the Mississippi. Um, it doesn't extend really very far inland. I, I, we've, there's a few pieces that show up in the canon, but not much. Um, so it's kind of right along the Mississippi going up towards Spring Lake Park around there and up a little bit into the St. Croix. And that's the Nininger phase that's characterized by Bramer Triangular Punctate Pottery. Now from Red Wing and to the south, 
um, there's another kind of a phase going on, and that's characterized by this kind of pottery called angelo punctated pottery. And uh, that lower shirt, that's a shirt of angelo punctated pottery. And I know it doesn't look like much to you, but part of the problem that you can see with these late woodland kinds of pottery is that it's very, very thin and it's tempered. That is, it has little bits of crushed granite in it. And unfortunately, what that means is that it breaks apart really, really easily. And so it's very tough to find big pieces of the stuff. Um, anyway, so that's then uh, the Angelo Punky, the stuff that's called the Lewis phase. Okay. Now, these are folks who have a lot of commonalities, right? They are all engaging in a, a low level of food production. They're growing a little bit of crops, not very much. Um, a little bit of maize and, you know, some sunflowers and stuff like that. Um, and then they're also building mounds, uh, you know, hunting deer, stuff like that, right? So it's typical late woodland Indian kind of stuff. Um, so we find both of those kinds of pottery in Red Wing. They kind of overlap in their distribution there. Um, and this is where we have most of the kind of the, the big-ish late woodland habitation sites. So these are the sites where you can, where you can actually find some of this, this late woodland pottery in the area. Okay. Now what's really interesting though, when I started to take a look at just a few of the, the late woodland sites, right? Most of them only have like one kind of pottery at them and most of them are really small, okay? There's a few that are bigger. Uh, the Cooling Tower site, the Mosquito Terrace site. Um, there's one uh, below the Marrow Terrace that I can't remember the name of offhand. Um, but there are a few of them that are somewhat bigger. Now, what I mean by, by small and big, right, because these are just kind of vague relevant terms or uh, relative terms, um, is that uh, most, you know, kind of standard late woodland sites are not larger than, oh, basically a quarter acre, right? They're, they're pretty tiny. But there's a few of them kind of right in the river valley that are on the order of two or three acres. So they're like six to eight times larger than other late woodland sites. And at those, what's very interesting is we actually end up seeing lots of different kinds of what we think is non-local pottery, as well as some other stuff that we really can't quite figure out, right? So in, those, in the pictures there on the top left, that's a piece of what's called Madison vertical cord mark pottery or Madison plain pottery. The upper right, that's a piece of Clam River or Cathio pottery from northwestern Minnesota. Um, that uh, center left piece, that's a piece of Onamia cordrap stick pottery from central Minnesota. That piece on the uh, center right, that's a piece of a newly named type of pottery called Loomis cord and press pottery from south, south, southeastern Minnesota. Uh, below, uh, on the bottom left, uh, that's a piece of um, St. Croix stamped pottery. That's also from central Minnesota. The bottom right is a piece of what's called Rulins Creek pottery. That's from southwestern Wisconsin. Um, and then that big piece on the bottom left, that's a piece of pottery that I found at the Mosquito Terrace site um, that doesn't fit any comfortable typology. Right? It's got knotted cord impressions and, you know, incised lines and it's got kind of a really big tall lip and rim and it's got, it's got two things. So it kind of has some attributes of the, the, the um, uh, Angelo punctated pottery. It's got some attributes of Clam River Cathio pottery. It's got some attributes of, of Bramer pottery, but it's, it's kind of its own thing. Right? So it's, it's really kind of interesting that we have a couple of main pottery types that are kind of typical of the area, but at the very large late woodland sites, we find like a dozen different kinds of pottery at single villages. Now, most late woodland villages are tiny and only have one type of pottery, but there's a few that have a lot and very different kinds of pottery. So from across the whole region. So what does this look like if we want to map out where is this stuff coming from? So in the late woodland period, around starting around 900 AD or so, what we have is evidence via the pottery 
that people are coming into the Red Wing area from the upper St. Croix Valley, from central Minnesota, from south central Minnesota, from southern Minnesota, and from southwestern Wisconsin, all coming into the region. Uh, big, nice big red star is, of course, Red Wing. So that's really kind of interesting, right? People, a lot, of, a lot of places, people tend to think of the Lake Woodland as kind of boring. It's, and the Lake Woodland folks are called the good gray cultures because they're, they're not all that interesting. I happen to like gray, but whatever. The point is, there's actually a lot more going on here than anybody thought. And particularly in Red Wing, we can see that a lot of stuff is coming into the area. Okay. So then we have the silver nail phase. Now, those are the locations where we have major silver nail phase um, uh, components or sites, right, parts of sites. Um, and what do we mean by the silver nail phase? Well, this is the kind of the really typical pottery of Red Wing that most people think of, right? There's some of this in the museum there, right? And this is the kind of pottery that people looked at and said, golly, that looks like middle Mississippian pottery from down by Cahokia. The thing is, um, people who are actually familiar with Cahokia type Ramian sized pottery, as it's called down there, look at this and know that this is nothing at all like Ramian sized pottery from the American bottom. This is its own weird thing that people in Red Wing were doing. Right? Like pottery like this, you'd never see kind of big, broad finger trails on pottery like this. These are you know, wide, shallow trails. You'd never see pots that are so profusely decorated. You'd never see so much variability in how the rim was shaped and how the, how the shoulder is shaped. Right? So there's a lot of variability inside of this pottery, and there's a lot that makes it not very Middle Mississippian at all. Right? But it's what people thought of that Middle Mississippian connection is what people thought of when they first saw this. Well, what do we also see in terms of non-local pottery? That is, if that's the local stuff, what do we have for non-local stuff going on at the same time? Well, here again, you can see that there's actually a lot of different kinds of pottery that's present at these big central villages that where the silver nail pottery so in that upper left one, uh, that's actually a kind of pottery called Grant Court and Pressed, and that's from southwestern Wisconsin. That upper right one, that's a kind of pottery called Hartley Crosshatched. That's from northeastern Iowa. Um, that center left um, part, uh, that's actually a newly named kind of pottery called Waconia pottery, um, and that's actually from around the Lake Waconia area, so it's uh, kind of uh, west central Minnesota. Um, that bottom center piece, the real big shirt against the gray background, that's actually a piece of Cambria pottery from around the Mankato area. The lower right piece, uh, that's actually a piece of Anderson crosshatched pottery from northwestern Iowa. And then that lower left hand part against the back uh, shirt against the black background, we don't know what that is. It, it, we, we don't, it's just like completely weird stuff, but it shows up all over the place. We have no idea what it is, but it's not local, right? If you look at the temper in it and the paste, that's not a local pottery. We think it's from the plains um, because that's what we see other pieces. But we don't know quite what it's called or where it really originates. So here again, we can actually take a look at some of the additional materials that uh, indicate, you know, a Mississippian contact. We have some pieces of copper. There are little tiny rolled beads of copper, but then there's these little interesting copper figures. Um, that upper left copper piece, that's actually, um, uh, it's kind of difficult to imagine, but if you imagine like a, 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 a design of a Thunderbird, right? So there's the, the head uh, and then the shoulders with the wings coming down and then the wings scoop up, and then there's a tail that comes down and on one side it has little things. That's actually a Thunderbird's tail, a little copper cutout of a Thunderbird, okay? And that's a piece of a tail. That was found at the, Am the Adams Village. That piece on the right, that copper piece on the right, that's from the Bryan site, and that's actually a, a copper mace form pendant. Um, that's actually typical of uh, cultural manifestations down toward, oh, Atlanta, 
So it's kind of from kind of the Georgia area. It's kind of southeastern ceremonial kind of stuff. So that's really out of place here. But it's it's not pre precisely speaking. It's not Mississippian, so to speak. It's just kind of something that shows up. But it's from the southeastern ceremonial group. Okay. We also have lots of cubes of of galena. Now that piece in the center left, uh, that little gray cubic thing, that's a piece of galena. <clears throat> That's a lead sulfide ore that comes from the, the Grant County, Wisconsin area. So <clears throat> obviously we know lead doesn't float up river. So people brought that from Grant County up to the Red Wing area. Now what's interesting is that Red Wing is one of the only places that we actually see <clears throat> those cubes of Galena. It, they don't really don't show up anywhere else in the upper valley and they're almost never even found down by Cahokia. It's really unusual. So that, it, it's again, not really a Mississippian thing. The piece on the lower left, that is another kind of Southeastern ceremonial cult kind of thing and people take it to be Middle Mississippian, but it's a, a little shell mascot, right? The short-nosed god mascot. Uh, that's from the Marrow site on the Wisconsin side of the river. There may be a second one in a private collection somewhere, but nobody's ever seen it. It's just somebody has said that someone has one. Um, and on the lower left or lower right there, there you see a couple of chunky stones, right? Those are otherwise called stone discoidals. And they're, you know, maybe five, six centimeters, maybe seven or eight centimeters in diameter. Um, and they're actually used for playing a kind of game. Okay, I won't bother describing the game, but the point is, there's in all of this, there's evidence of kind of very broad regional contacts going all the way down to the Gulf Coast that are coming up into the Red Wing area around this time. And people have said that this is evidence of Mississippian contact, but in fact, it's actually not. It's much more generalized. So when we look at the input lines uh, coming at the silver nail phase, we can see that they actually look a lot like what was going on in already in the late woodland period before this, but a little bit more extensive, right? So we can see stuff coming in from northwestern Iowa. We can see stuff coming in from far southwestern uh, Wisconsin, maybe even northeastern or northwestern Illinois. Um, but we can see that there's actually a lot of kind of stuff coming down from central and northern Minnesota too. Right, so Red Wing is again at the heart of where a whole bunch of stuff is coming in. Um, now we get to this other thing, right? this thing called Oneota. Now these are sites that have Oneota habitations, right? or, or like houses and pits and stuff like that. Now you can immediately see that there's actually quite a lot more of these. Right? There's a lot more of Oneota sites than woodland sites or than silver nail phase sites. And they're all over the landscape. So, what do we see there? We see this kind of pottery, right? And this is the other major kind of pottery that we see often in the Red Wing area. So the top shirts, those are a type called canon incised. Um, the left one is from the McClellan site. The right one is from the Silvernail site. Um, and now note, if any of you are familiar with the, the Oneota group, this is a group that's ancestral today to Dakota peoples, to Ho-Chunk peoples, to Iowa Oto peoples, to Missouri peoples, right? So there's a whole bunch of different groups that are part of what we call Oneota, okay? Um, so that upper stuff, that's kind of classic um, uh, canon sized pottery that we see at the Bertrand site and a bunch of different sites. The lower site, the lower two pieces of pottery, that's a kind of pottery that we call the link type pottery, named after the famous Adolf Link. Um, who was a, a prominent collector and, and very generous um, uh, donor to the, to the museum on various things. Anyway, so this is sort of a, an interesting, weird form of pottery that just we just almost never see anywhere else in, like anywhere in Minnesota or Wisconsin. It's pretty local to Red Wing. You see a few pieces of it up in the St. Croix Valley and out in uh, the Blue Earth Valley. Now, and we'll get back to that, right? So it's sometimes seen outside of Red Wing, but it's, it's normally confined to Red Wing. So you can see that, that you know, when you look at the designs, it looks like it has kind of the wing shape on it that was on all of that, um, that rolled rim only, or the silver nail type pottery. But it's got the rim that's kind of high and out flaring like the Oneota pottery and like Lake Woodland pottery that came before. So it's kind of an interesting hybrid, right? So when we look then at on these Oneota relationships, 
we can see that there's bi-directional contact going on now uh, from Red Wing up to the St. Croix and out to the Blue Earth area and other relationships where I have a question mark there like, well, did they go to La Crosse? Ah, I'm willing to entertain the idea, but we would need some evidence. And then there's other stuff going out to um, Fort, oh, is that Ridgely out there or Ripley? I can never, I always get that wrong. Um, anyway, that Fort, whatever, Fort R in like <laughs> southwestern Minnesota there. Okay. So there's some, some maps and stuff like that. Now let's, we'll take a brief look at some radiocarbon dates. This is, I, I just wrote another book chapter for the Big Red Wing book that, that has these dates all in it. And, and don't worry about not understanding all of this stuff so far. It'll kind of pull together as we continue with the talk. So we can see that around 1050 or so, things start to really happen in Red Wing, but it's really between 1150 and 1300 that there's a lot of stuff going on. Now, these different lines represent radiocarbon dates, high precision radiocarbon dates, that are associated with the different kinds of pottery that we looked at in terms of the silver nail and the cannon incised or Bartron and the link type pottery. And you can see that they are all being made and used at the same time. People used to argue that it was a linear development sequence from late woodland, then Mississippian people came in, introduced a new type of pottery, and then Oneyota evolved after that. But what we can see based on the dates is that Mississippian stuff and Oneyota stuff dates to the same time. So they cannot have an ancestor descendant relationship they're part of the same thing going on at the same time. Now, what that all tells us is that there's a really radically changing social landscape going on in the Red Wing area. Before the Silver Nail phase, before about you know, 1050, 1100 AD, what we see is that there's a lot of late woodland folks who are already going into the Red Wing area. Right? Who the local really is, is something we, we, we're still a little bit unclear about. It, it may be that there's, you know, two different groups that are sharing the landscape or three or four different groups that are sharing the landscape. It's really unclear, right? And, and I started to think about this recently. I thought, you know, it's kind of like a Venn diagram, if any of you are familiar with that, where you, you kind of plot out on a map or plot out, on, plot out on a sheet of paper, like here's this kind of thing here, here's this kind of thing here. They overlap in the middle and that's that shared territory, right? So it may be that Red Wing was kind of acting like a cultural Venn of the valley, that there's all these different groups in the region that kind of overlap there. And that's kind of what's laying the foundation for some of the unclarity, but also is feeding into the reason why all of these changes in this particular format are going on. But we know that those started in the late woodland. They did not start with Mississippian evidence. Okay, we also saw that during the silver nail phase, again, all the evidence is that people are coming into the Red Wing area from again, across the whole region. And there's almost no evidence that anything from some Red Wing is going anywhere else. Now, maybe that means that what is going out from Red Wing is something intangible, or maybe it's something that decayed. Maybe they were trading grain out of Mankato. Maybe they were trading hides, I'm sorry, Mankato, Red Wing. Maybe they're trading things that decayed out of the Red Wing area. Don't know. But we do know from the pottery that everybody's coming in there, right? Now, interestingly, after this, the silver nail phase, we see interaction going on between Red Wing and the St. Croix Valley and Red Wing and the Blue Earth Valley. We see lots of interaction going on there and some between Red Wing and uh, you know, points to the West, but not a lot elsewhere, right? So it really does change quite a lot. Oh, there you go, it's full written. We do also see that Red Wing was not abandoned that there's a major Oneota presence in the Red Wing area until at least 1400 CE, right? So all of those ideas that people had were incorrect. They were all incorrect. 
right? The, the middle Mississippian influence in the Red Wing area is not why Red Wing exists. There's a hundred plus years of late woodland things going on, right? And the late woodland stuff seems to be that people are moving out of the tributary valleys and into the main valley and then kind of interacting along the Mississippi uh, through St. Croix and up to Red Wing and then up into the major rivers from there, right? We also see that late woodland groups started to live in big villages all together, mixing all of their styles together, right? And that's a really interesting thing going on. We also see that around 1050 to 1300, that the scale of all of this increases, that there's a much more of a cultural draw from the whole region. Um, and we then also can note that um, all of this stuff that's going on, all that silver nail aggregation, right, where we see that silver nail kind of special pottery, that only shows up at a few central locations. All of that woodland stuff and Oneota stuff, that shows up all over the place. So what's clear is that that silver nail type pottery, that's really just this, the sign of aggregation. That's the kind of pottery that is emblemic or that is kind of evidence of them blending their traditions together and doing something new with it. Right? So they're doing a lot of build mound building and feasting and all of that kind of stuff. And, and I don't need to go into that. That's a, you know, I've talked about that at a lot of different talks, but now then, so that's the real answer to question one, right? And so we know that, right? So thinking back to those questions I originally started with, now we have question two, why, right? It's clear that Mississippian influence cannot be the answer to why all of that happened because it was starting to happen before middle Mississippian influence. So that, it can't be a causative factor. So what is going on, right? Well, when we take a broader look, right, when we contextualize and look at what's going on across Minnesota and Wisconsin, and Illinois and Iowa and kind of across the whole region, we see that everybody, and even way into the Southwest, right, if any of you are familiar with ancestral Puebloan peoples, you can see that you know, there's a lot of culture change going on at the same time, right? And what this suggests is that there's probably something very big and broad going on. Right? When people living in different environments are all kind of like changing at the same time, that means that something broad is going on. Now, in the 1960s, a couple of researchers named uh, Reed Bryson and um, Dave Berries from the University of Wisconsin-Madison proposed that climate change was, to ex was one of these ways that you could explain what everything was going on, right? And they did that following this, this researcher named H.H. H. Lamb, <clears throat> having recognized in uh, literature records from Europe and all of that, that there was this thing called the medieval warm period. So he was doing literature research and he realized that people were mentioning, get this, that the best wines in all of Europe during the medieval warm period came from England. Can you imagine English wine? I mean, ugh. But anyway, yeah, apparently English wine at the time was the best. And the Italians, boy, you, they couldn't get grapes to grow to save their lives. It was just too hot. So there's this thing called the medieval warm period. Now we call it the medieval climatic anomaly. Anyway, so Bryson and Barris suggested that maybe there's some environmental change going on that's kind of causing this. But you know, in the 1980s, when people decided that climatic determinism was was out of fashion, and you really shouldn't, you know, you really shouldn't think that people would be subject to the weather. Um, well, they discarded the idea. They said there's a lack of evidence. We we know that Mississippian stuff is going on, so that must really be the explanation. But again, we've seen that the changes predate Mississippian, so that can't be the answer. So what is this thing called the medieval climatic anomaly? On a global scale, it's this period from 900 to 1300 CE where global climate becomes highly variable, right? And that's why the name was changed away from being the medieval warm period to being the medieval climatic anomaly is because it's not warm everywhere on earth, right, at the time. Some places were warmer, some places were cooler, some places were drier, some places were wetter. It's really kind of crazy. So we look at the tree cores and ice cores and co uh, coral cores, cores from coral, you know, in the sea. Um, and there's like temperature increases in a lot of areas, but some temperature decreases in other areas. Like for example, the Pacific, the Southern Pacific was actually 
somewhat cooler, kind of leading to a perpetual state of La Nina, as we know today, right? So some records, those marine sediments show that the South Pacific was cold, but they also show that the North Atlantic was really quite a bit warmer. Now, you know that changes in ocean temperature can really cause some havoc on environmental circulation patterns, atmospheric circulation. Okay. We also know that there's this other weird thing going on called the medieval maximum, where there's a sustained period of solar variability, but generally speaking, higher solar output. That is, there's more radiation and particularly more ultraviolet radiation coming out of the sun for this period between 900 to 1300 CE. So temperature goes kind of nuts, um, uh, solar factors go kind of nuts, and it looks like what happened was there's a kind of a positive feedback loop that went on such that <clears throat> oceanic circulation and solar forcing caused uh, a really big set of really abnormal changes, just a highly variable uh, environment over the world for this, you know, 400 year period. And interestingly as well, there was a reduction in volcanic activity. Now volcanic activity usually puts ash into the atmosphere and that reflects sunlight so it gets cool. Now that's the other thing that's going on. There's less volcanoes, so there's less cooling. Ah, so this is kind of interesting. So there is something going on in terms of the climate globally. What do the models for the Midwest show? It shows that there's modest warming, right? One to three degrees Celsius warmer across the region. That's that upper map there, right? You can see the Midwest there. Um, to the southwest of the Midwest, like so kind of in the southwest, it's actually a half degree Celsius warmer. Now remember, Celsius are, are you know, it's more than, than Fahrenheit. So this is, it's modest, but it's real. But what's really, really interesting is that there are massive, like pronounced droughts across the region, right? So most of the region as you can see from the lower thing, most of the region is in near perpetual Palmer drought severity index of 1.5. There are there's a little period in the middle where it moderates and it you know kind of actually becomes almost normal kind of normal modern precipitation. But then there's a particularly harsh dry period that lasts for at least 30 years, maybe 50 years, which is a mega drought across the whole Midwest where the Palmer drought severity index is up to two for a lot of that period. And that's between 12 or 1150 and 1250 CE, right at the heart of all of this stuff that's going on. Okay, so that's the Midwest, right? What about Minnesota and Wisconsin, right? I mean, that's all South, who cares about that? Well, for a long time, it wasn't entirely clear that there was really much going on up here. But we've actually recently started doing research in the Eau Claire area. And one of the things that we found, and this is the advice of we, I mean, uh, Dr. Phil Larson and myself from the, the Earth Lab and, and some of our colleagues at the, uh, the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, um, Gary Running and Doug Faulkner, I mean, they're great guys. Oh, what a, I couldn't ask for a better working group. Anyway, we actually have started researching uh, these, these curious landscape features over in the Eau Claire area. Um, and you can see them in that lower image there. That's what's called a LIDAR image or a light detection and ranging map. So it's a laser map. Um, and you can see a couple of really big, like what look like piles of sand. Well, they are. It's a particular kind of sand dune called a parabolic dune. And they're in what's called a cliff top position. Now, what's really interesting is that we were able to date the time that those sand grains in those dunes were last exposed to sunlight called um, optically stimulated luminescence dating, if you're really interested. What we were able to find out is that those dunes formed during the medieval climatic anomaly. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is those dunes are 60, 60 feet tall. Imagine winds and dryness so bad that it can form a 60 foot sand dune in the Midwest. We have other evidence from the Mississippi Valley that there are, no, or there are also linear dunes forming, forming in the Mississippi Valley a little way south of Winona. So there's actually some interesting evidence piling up, so to speak, pardon the pun, that there is in fact 
a real local signal of this going on. Now, this actually now starts to dovetail with a couple other just little tiny bits of evidence that went kind of unnoticed in the literature before, where Jim Knox, uh, a geomorphologist from uh, Madison, was looking at flood deposits in tributary river valleys, that is river valleys tributary to the Mississippi, or the Mississippi. And he actually found that there was evidence in the medieval climatic anomaly period of uh, increased strength but decreased frequency of summer storms. That is, on the whole, it got kind of a little bit drier. There were fewer kind of long duration rainfall events. And then ones that when they did come through, they were really severe and they resulted in a lot of erosion and stuff like that in those tributary valleys. Ernie Boshart from Wisconsin La Crosse, he's retired now, he in a different study was looking at deer remains and he saw that at Lake Woodland sites, there were fewer deer remains around the area at this period. And his suggestion was that, oh, well, you know, people must have been over hunting them. But I look at the site distribution, I look at the pollen items, look at all the wood or all the, the pollen and, and, and understanding uh, tree dynamics and all that. There weren't nearly enough people in the area to out, to out hunt all the deer, to over hunt, right? That's just not possible in this case. What is possible though, is that if there is actually all of this drought going on, natural productivity would have declined. The deer would have had less to browse on. So either they would have starved or left the area, at which point then people could have had a negative impact on deer populations. So there's actually several different lines of evidence that are converging saying there is this important environmental signal going on at the time. So what, right? What, what's the big deal, right? Well, the thing is, at the beginning of the medieval climatic anomaly, around AD 900, people in the northern part of the Midwest were kind of small scale farmers, growing a little bit of crops, stuff like that, but mostly kind of, you know, gathering wild resources, right? Picking berries and, you know, scavenging nuts and hunting deer and, you know, all of that kind of happy stuff that you think of doing in the woodlands, right? But it's, it, there's an extensive utilization of naturally abundant um, gathered foods. And now these folks were largely distributed across the whole region, up in the tributary valleys and the, the inland lake regions and all of that kind of stuff. So the south, in the central Mississippi Valley and the Ohio Valley, the Missouri Valley, all of that, people there had already transitioned to being intensive food producers, that is, agriculturalists. They were also using naturally abundant plants and animals for their subsistence, but to a lesser degree. The thing is, drought impacts both, but it doesn't necessarily impact them in the same way. Right? It will, you know, obviously it decreases natural productivity, right? If there's not as much water, there's not as many berries, there's not as much stuff for deer to eat, there's not as much, you know, water for fish to breed in. There's, you know, lots and lots of problems that come from natural systems with drought. Drought is also not particularly good for people who grow crops that don't irrigate them. So for either group, the existence of the medieval climate, either the Northern groups were like casual uh, food producers and heavily reliant on natural productivity, or the Southern groups who are food producers and less reliant on natural productivity, for either one of them, this, this period of drought required some kind of a response. So what do we get then? We actually get the probable real answer to number two. And I say probable because it's a hypothesis. We're not entirely sure because we have to do a lot of testing, right? We have little bits of evidence here and there suggesting that these environmental things are going on, but we still really got to kind of really work on teasing this out because it's, it's, if this is really what's going on, it's a pretty big story and it's a, it's a pretty relevant story. So what it looks like the probable real answer for number two is in the northern part of the Midwest, so for Minnesota and Wisconsin, we can see that in terms of looking at site locations, people are moving out of the dry interiors and the smaller tributary valleys, and they're actually moving to the major tributary or the major valley in the area, which is the Mississippi. So there is actually a population movement, just like we saw the, the artifacts already showing us right? We know that this is going on and now we know why it might have been going on. 
because it's gotten really dry and kind of hot, right? So then we see very interestingly in those groups, a transition to an intensification in food production in terms of agriculture. Now that might seem a little bit odd to you, right? Why would people become food producers? Why would they start growing crops if it's droughty? Remember, uh, they actually moved to the main part of the Mississippi Valley and into kind of, you know, concentrated populations in like the lower part of the Wisconsin Valley, the lower part of the Chippewa Valley. And what do we know about the Mississippi River and the St. Croix River and the Chippewa River and the Wisconsin River? Their headwaters are in northern Minnesota and northern Wisconsin. Those are areas that were not adversely affected by de decreasing water availability. That means the upper parts of those river valleys were all still completely well watered. And it would make complete sense that these folks would actually move down into areas where there's not water stress. And because there was still drought going on in the uplands where, you know, kind of the natural productivity things are, they're still gathering stuff up there, right? They stopped doing quite so much of that and focus more on reducing the risk of food stress by adopting food production. That's a rational response to this pattern that we can see going on. In the lower part of the areas in the central Midwest, so in Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, there we see a different response, right? See, there they didn't really have anywhere to go because they're already concentrated in the river valleys because they've already made that transition to being food producers. So intensification, like expanding how much agriculture they're doing was their initial response. But remember, they're then particularly down there, is this 30 to 50 year mega drought. And that was really devastating. That we see a lot of evidence of population stress. There's some nutrient stress that shows up in the human remains. Um, we can also see that um, uh, part of their solution uh, was to actually, some groups migrated out of that region they migrate up the Mississippi, up the Spoon, up, you know, up, kind of get away from that central area where there's too many people for the resources that are productive, but also that they built these really extended interaction networks. Why? To be able to access resources that could be produced farther away. Right? So the way that they're actually reacting to the same, same kind of stimulus is by doing two different things. So both of these things that they're doing, right, both reactions have the effect of increasing intergroup interaction in specific, specific locations, right? Um, so the Mississippian groups, they actually expand their network outward and the groups in the north, their network kind of congregates around a single location, around Red Bull. So in the north, the format of their reaction was to become more cooperative. In the South, their reaction was to become more competitive. Interesting. So in terms of conclusions then, uh, what we see is that before around 900 CE, many or most groups across the Midwest had become food producers to, to one degree or another. Um, it was less intensive in the North, it was more intensive in the Central Valley in the South, they both were still utilizing wild resources. Around 900 to 1300, then we see the medieval climatic anomaly happen. And there's a lot of uh, increased temperature, a little bit of increased temperature, a lot of decreased moisture. Um, and that led to a certain amount of resource stress and led to population movement, intensification in food production, uh, increased intergroup interaction. And the specific way in which people did that in those different places is kind of conditioned by what their starting conditions were. Right? If they're up in the Mississippi Valley and they have access to water, they, you know, that's fine. Then they kind of start growing more crops because that's fine. There's still water in the valley, which is where you grow your crops, right? On the, the floodplain, right? Down in the lower part of the valley, well, they're, they're kind of experiencing a little bit more stress. So they kind of reach their cultural tendrils or tentacles out and gather more resources from more distant locations. Uh, so those pre-existing patterns of interaction and uh, uh, whatever that they were doing, those fed into what the solution to this climate crisis was in the medieval climatic anomaly between 900 and 1300 AD.
And as a final point of, of conclusion, uh, what this also tells us is that nothing is ever simple. Right? If, if it seems like there's a simple answer to something, you're not looking close enough because there's like never a simple answer, particularly when it comes to people. We are weird, right? We're super odd organisms. We do a lot of crazy stuff. We interact with the environment in all kinds of really, weird, really weird ways, but also nothing is ever new, right? We're looking at how the environment is changing now and it is changing, make no mistake about it. It's changing radically and very, very quickly, but it's changing for different reasons than it changed before. That said, there is this previous period, the medieval climatic anomaly, where we can see certain kinds of climate change going on and we can see how people dealt with it a thousand years ago, right? It's a complex environmental landscape. It's a complex cultural landscape. And this really weird set of environmental changes goes on and it led to them having to adapt their life ways. We're gonna have to do that too. Thankfully, there's some movement to start doing some of that. Um, but we can take a certain amount of lesson from how ancient people were doing these things. Um, we can think about alternative cropping strategies. We can think about different ways of building cooperative networks. We don't all have to be in competition with each other. We can collaborate and that can actually lead to some pretty beneficial results. Um, so that's what, uh, uh, what I wanted to talk with you about today. And I don't know where I am for time. So, um, Anyone have any time? questions? Or, yeah, do we have any questions? I'm happy to try to entertain any, or I'll try to answer. Looks like we have one in the chat for you, Ron. All righty, I'll open the chat here. So let's see here. Um, oh yes, worked really good. <laughs> Okay, so um, do you know the locations of the clay quarries and fire pits in the Red Wing area? What was the population of the Red Wing community? Any pipe stone eyes from the Red Wing? Um, yeah, okay, so uh, do I know the locations of the clay quarries and fire pits in the Red Wing area? Um, so uh, I, I assume that you're talking about the uh, clay quarries and, and such like that from that, that pre-contact people were using. Um, and the answer there is, um, uh, or that prehistoric people were doing, um, there we don't. Um, we assume that they're actually kind of harvesting clays from the nearby uh, kind of uh, lake bed. I, I, when I've done uh, work out in the Red Wing Industrial Park where like Redell Shoes and Capital Safety and all that kind of stuff is, um, there are some, some clay deposits in that landform. So it's possible people were simply digging down where their villages were and finding lake clays down there from, you know, late glacial times. Um, you know, it's possible they're also getting the clay from just kind of exposed uh, banks of the, the Cannon or the, the Mississippi and such like that. So um, in terms of where they were firing the pottery, no idea. We've never found any fire firing pits. Now that it, there may be some, there may be something interesting going on when, when um, who was it? Uh, I think it was Ed Schmidt in the 1930s was uh, digging into the mounds um, around the area. Now, again, remember that is so illegal now, so <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Um, but when he was digging into some of them, uh, a number of them he found had what he called burned clay floors. Now, that would be really, really strange. Um, but he also noted that those ones didn't have any uh, burials in them. And so I, I, I've come to wonder whether or not what, what he was finding was actually like kilns that had been turned into a mound as a way of kind of ceremonially closing that kiln after making a, a kind of pottery. I don't really know, but no, we haven't found the where they're quarrying the clay and where they're firing the pottery in ancient times. Um, in terms of the population of Red Wing at the time, boy, that's a really good question. Um, it, to come up with an accurate population estimate, we have to uh, have a good sense of how many residential structures there were at any one particular time. Now, most of the residential structures that we found uh, at Red Wing sites 
um, are that most of them are square to rectangular. There are some that are round to oval, but they're mostly uh, seven to eight meters across. And based on anthropological studies of uh, kind of low complexity uh, indigenous groups around the world, houses of that size tended to have, you know, seven to 10 people living in them. Um, so we, you know, we can estimate, you know, based on that, how many people would have been in any one of these houses. But the maximum extent of archaeological excavation that took place at the Bryan site was 12 and a half percent of the site was investigated before the rest of it was destroyed with no study for extraction of gravel and for creation of Highway 61. Um, I ran the calculations uh, for the big Red Wing book that I'm doing, and we have so far investigated uh, one tenth of one percent of the area of the Silvernail Village. We've investigated less than half of a percent. I think it's actually like three one hundredths of a percent, maybe, of the area of the Merrill Village. Um, we've investigated less than half of a percent of the Energy Park Village. Um, so how we would actually come up with any kind of an accurate population estimate is beyond me. Uh, just no clue at all. Suffice it to say that if in a period of 400 years, people built more than 3,000 burial mounds, which is true, there must have been a lot of people. Right, um, because most of these mounds were about 30 feet in diameter and about three feet tall, but a lot were considerably larger. Um, and no matter how you shake it, and remembering that all of this is hand labor, you know, either with a digging stick or with a bison scapula hoe to loosen up the soil, um, and then, you know, piloting, piloting it into, you know, baskets or ceramic pots or something like that to put it into a pile. Um, either way, you look at, I mean, that's a lot of hand labor, right? That's not something that, you know, 500 people do in 10 years, right? So we've got, you know, a few hundred years going on but there's thousands of mounds. So the population, at least seasonally, that is during the warm season, must have been really pretty high. Okay, in terms of pipestone items, yes, we have found a few, very, very rare, very rare. Um, there's one pipestone fragment um, that I found at the Bartran village, and because it was burned, it's the color has changed, so it's difficult to know if it's actually red pipestone from the pipestone quarries in, in southwestern Minnesota, or whether it's actually the Baraboo purple pipestone. It could be that too, um, but the, the color has changed, so I, I really I really can't type one. But otherwise, um, pipestone is exceptionally rare in the in the Red Wing area. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, I want to go to the Shakopee Museum. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you've, you've been there, I, I guess, but um, uh, if you saw the exhibit on their, um, their dugout canoe um, and the, the text on that, I, I did that for that. I analyzed the wood chart, the wood for them. So they, they gave me little fragments of their dugout canoes. I identified the wood from all of the known dugout canoes in the state of Minnesota. Um, and so, yeah, I really want to go there because I helped develop one of their exhibits, but I still haven't been to the museum itself. So um, let's see. Does this have anything to do with the Little Ice Age? Really, really fun question because this is immediately before the Little Ice Age. So all of this stuff happens, you know, between 900 and 1300. What's really kind of fun is that between 1300 and about 1400, 1450, um, you know, climate is, you know, kind of typical, normal, like things kind of, re you know, recover to normal sorts of conditions. But then around 1400, 1450, all of a sudden we get the opposite thing going on where all of a sudden it's the Little Ice Age and everything gets really cold. Um, this corresponds with a protracted period of solar minimum. Um, there's the Maunder minimum and the Spore minimum and all of that, um, where there's you know, really reduced solar output, but also at the same time, we see really dramatically increased volcanic activity. 
so you know, is how these these different environmental systems kind of Im end up impacting and kind of creating feedback loops on each other. So the little ice age is what happens immediately after all of the silver nail phase stuff and the population aggregation into redwood. And so that's when we actually see um, uh, one of the things I noted in one of the slides is that, you know, the later Oneota people in Red Wing, they don't live right on the Mississippi River, they move back, they move into the tributary valleys, into the Hay Creek Valley, the Spring Creek Valley, um, and back up into the Cannon Valley, maybe into the Bell Creek Valley, we haven't done any survey there, I, I'm sure, I'm absolutely certain there's going to be sites there if we ever get around to doing a survey there, right? But so the Little Ice Age comes right after this. And that does lead to a whole series of other changes that, that stretch out onto the plains. Um, and uh, if you want some time, I can give a, come back and give a talk about uh, the effects of the Little Ice Age on Native peoples between 1400 and 1700 AD, because it's, it's pronounced, it's fascinating, it's just incredibly neat stuff. Um, okay, so next, what are paleoclimate records? Yeah, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, since this is kind of the thing that I do, I end up using a lot of words that people don't understand. So I thank you for, for uh, asking me to clarify. Um, paleoclimate records um, are actually just different kinds of records that we have that tell us about what ancient climates were like. So for example, um, we can go up to, well, for a little while yet, we can go up to the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet and take giant cores of the ice. Um, now um, there, and I, I don't, I won't get into an incredibly complicated technical description, right? Um, but this is some of the stuff that I teach about, so I, I kind of lapse into that, unfortunately. So um, year after year after year, as the snow built up on the Greenland um, uh, island, right? Um, because it was cold, right? It would not actually fully melt every year, right? So the, I, the the snow would just build up and 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 build up, and build up, and build up right? And now based on the time of year, like in the warm season, um, there's more dusts that blow around in the northern hemisphere atmosphere um, because there's, you know, the sand or the soil uh, all over the places doesn't have snow on top of it. So sand and, and dusts and things like that can blow and get caught up in the atmosphere. And they lay deposits. Um, there's little tiny thin deposits of dust on the warm season um, snows or ices in the Greenland ice core. So each year you can actually see every single year of ice accumulation in the Greenland ice cores. Now this is just one kind of, of paleoenvironmental record. Right? The interesting thing is that as those layers of snow kind of compress because of gravity and turn into ice, they trap little tiny air bubbles in there. And those air bubbles reflect the, atmosp the atmospheric concentration of different gases at that specific year. So we can actually look at the, uh, the oxygen isotopes in those bubbles. And, and you know, isotopes are different chemical values of, of uh, an element, right? So um, uh, there's, based on sea, surf te sea surface temperatures and atmospheric temperatures and all of this kind of stuff, um, we know that there are certain uh, oxygen isotopes that are more prevalent when the weather is warmer versus the weather being colder. Uh, so we can look at the oxygen isotopes in those little tiny bubbles and we can actually get a proxy or uh, something that gives us information about air temperatures out of those tiny little bubbles. So that's one example. We can also, you know, tree cores or tree rings, uh, tree ring sequences. They're another, another kind of environmental proxy or, or paleoclimate record um, because, you know, trees respond, they grow every year, right? There's a new layer every year. And as the, you know, growing conditions of every individual year affect individual trees, they will put on either a thicker ring or a, th a thinner ring or whatever. So we can take a look at the cross section of a tree and we can reconstruct the climate um, based on the widths of the tree rings, knowing that some trees respond more to temperature change, some trees respond more to precipitation change. So we can look at the changing widths of the rings and re or, um, kind of reestablish or, or analyze uh, what the environment was like in, that, in all of those specific years that that tree was alive. And note, they've actually done tree ring climate reconstructions stretching back to 20 some thousand years, where every single year we know what, like, what was the temperature variance of this year, that year, this year, that year, whatever. 
Um, and there's other things. We can look at the, the carbon isotopes in each individual ring and look at sunspot numbers and radiocarbon productivity in the atmosphere and all kinds of crazy things. But it's really, really neat. Um, so that's what kind of paleoclimate records are. Is, uh, we take them out of Take them out of, uh, you know, speleothems out of um, stalactites and stalagmites in caves. Those build up in layers, and we can analyze the oxygen isotopes of that. There's marine sediments, that is the sediment that falls down to the bottom of the ocean, and that builds up year after year. We can look at the oxygen and carbon isotopes in the lime scale or the shells of the microfauna, the little tiny, tiny crustaceans that live in the water, and they die and they settle down to the bottom of the the lakes and the rivers and, and the, the oceans and you can look at different salt concentrations in lake core sediments and look at the pollens and so anyway but that's that's all stuff that that, um, that my doctoral minor was in quaternary paleoecology so that's all stuff that I ended up studying here. Um, do we have any other questions? It doesn't look like it. I want to thank everyone for coming today. If no one has any other questions I think we're going to end it for the day. Thank you Ron for coming. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to see everyone. And um, we'll, uh, um, oh, yeah, and I do have the uh, 2020 LIDAR. And um, uh, holy Moses, is that some interesting stuff. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I can, I can, if you want, I can come back and give you a talk about comparing the old LIDAR to the new LIDAR and different ways that we're using it. Um, it's just fascinating and brilliant. And holy cow. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm happy to see you all, and I hope you have a great day.